On the program today, let's bring up who we're going to be talking to in just a moment from now. Amitav Ghosh, the acclaimed author and public intellectual, is out with his latest book, The Nutmeg's Curse, a fascinating account of issues ranging from the COVID pandemic to climate change, all told through the history of a humble spice the nutmeg, the nutmeg, a very, very sort of fascinating and unusual proposition, as it were. And to understand more about this extraordinary uh, account and treaties and some of the most compelling contemporary issues of our time, let's go across to Amitav himself. He's joining us uh, from New York uh, this evening in India, morning in the United States of America. Amitav, what an absolutely fascinating idea to actually transport us back to the Dutch East India Company, uh, to a little island in Indonesia, uh, where the nutmeg, and uh, the, the the sort of the instinct to want to control that trade uh, actually leads to a kind of uh, settler colonialism that you think is persisting uh, to the modern day, even in the Indian context. How did this idea come to you? I know that I read that you've actually traveled uh, to Indonesia, to this island, in, uh, you know, against the backdrop of which your book uh, is set. But tell us a little more. Well, uh, you know, uh... Uh, Barka, I went uh, to the Banda Islands in 2016. I'd always wanted to go because, you know, the Spice Islands are legendary. But I didn't really know uh, very much uh, about them or about that history. It was only when I, when I got there that I really started to learn uh, about these islands and about what, uh, you know, what, what happened there. This tiny little island that you're showing uh, on the screen right now is an island called Run, Pulau Run. Uh, and it was actually the first British uh, uh, possession uh, in the uh, in Asia. Uh, you know, it was it was only when they exchanged this island for Manhattan uh, that they wow. actually started uh, expanding also in India. That is just, you know, extraordinary uh, detail. And I absolutely had no idea till I actually started reading your book and about your book. Uh, you know, and you centered the story of the nutmeg, uh, the spice and the Banda Islands at the heart of a kind of uh, colonialist debate that you believe uh, India is actually moving further into instead of emerging from you know one would think with the exit of the british uh you know we would have emerged fully from the shadows of colonialism but what you call an extractivist economy what you call settler colonialism uh talk a little bit about why you believe that why you're so dismayed and how the story of banda islands is one that you think is replicating even in present day india okay so uh, you know what <clears throat> what was so special about the banda islands is that you know it's this incredible sort of volcanic kind of soil uh, actually, the Banda Islands are just uh, the remnants of a, of a volcano. Uh, and one of these volcanoes is still active. That's Gunungapi. Uh, so, you know, the volcanoes and the soil created incredible forests, unbelievably beautiful uh, and rich forests. And uh, the nutmeg tree was one of the gifts of the, of the forest. And uh, this, uh, this tree brought uh, great wealth to the Bandanese. They became a very prosperous people. Uh, they were a successful until a uh, community the traveler and why but in 1621 once uh, uh, what they wanted straight away right from the beginning was a monopoly on spices and because the banda islands were very small there were very few people you know it was possible for them to actually just attack these islands and kill uh, all the uh, you know uh, kill or enslave uh, the entire population of the Banda archipelago. It's an extraordinary story. In 1621, this is what happened. The Dutch attacked this island and essentially massacred uh, a large part of the population, enslaved the rest, drove the rest away, and then brought settlers and slaves. A lot of the slaves uh, were from India, actually. So, you know, what you have here is an instance of something unbelievably beautiful granted to them by the earth, but that ultimately spells their doom. So it's a phenomenon called the resource curse, uh, you know, and you see this replicating again and again once extractivist economies uh, start proliferating. So I want you to I want you to elaborate. I was very struck by this phrase, the resource 
curse. You know, you're basically talking about uh, how areas that are uh, mineral rich, for example, and I know you, you know, you bring up the Niamgiri, uh, uh, for example, you bring up tracts of uh, Bengal, uh, all of these in the Indian context, which much like the Banda Island, uh, you're basically suggesting that areas that are naturally rich in resources become the battlefield for colonialists. The colonialists came in the form of the East India Company in, in the past. Uh, today, in what form do they come in? Well, today, what's happening is that, you know, uh, 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 after independence for 30 or 40 years, actually, we had uh, uh, we had a form of governance which was quite very protective of the forests and especially forest people, you know. Uh, all kinds of environmental regulations were, were created. Uh, forest people's rights were protected, never perfectly, never completely. But of course, uh, you know, there, uh, there was a, a set of regulations, you know, that uh, that prevented uh, outright extractivism of the kind that is now in full swing uh, across central India. And, uh, you know, what we have really adopted is this settler colonial model of just uh, dig up the earth, take everything you can from it. But, uh, you know, OK. That's not the only kind of successful economy <laughs> that that people can have. You know, uh, there's another model of capitalism, which is known as the East Asian model. That's the Japanese and South Korean model. Japanese and uh, Japan and South Korea did not actually. Uh, they were not blessed with resources. They had uh, they had very few minerals. They did not have uh, oil or natural gas. So what they adopted really was a sort of labor intensive model of economy. You know. So there are so many other directions in which, uh, you know, a successful economy can go, uh, you know. And, and and yet you argue, and you write in this book, that India, you believe, is reimagining itself uh, in the image of settler colonialism, instead of sort of sticking to the old uh, model of, of protectionistic, uh, 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 you know, template. It's, it's moving into this more predatory uh, sort of expression of colonialism. And it would, of course, take us back to that old uh, sort of development debate that has never really been uh, fully resolved. One of the interesting things in the, in that you write, Amitabh, is that you know while while the right wing you say can be blamed for the weaponization of uh, mysticism, uh, the self-professedly secular Congress, I'm quoting you here, or even the com you know the communists in Bengal, have not necessarily been different when it comes to this expression of colonialism. So speak to that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, basically what happened after 1990 uh, is that. Uh, um, the Washington consensus was articulated, you know, by the most powerful country on earth, the last remaining superpower. And the Washington consensus is fundamentally, you know, a settler colonial model of economy. And that's basically exactly what was adopted, uh, you know, gradually at first, but with increasing speed. So there's no doubt that, you know, it was the Congress and uh, equally, I would say it was the uh, um, even the left-wing parties, uh, certainly in Bengal, the CPM uh, launched on this huge model of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of enclosures, you know, just uh, just closing off, uh, trying to seize farmers' lands for factories and so on. So that 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 has accelerated since uh, since 1990, and today we have this full-on sort of attack uh, on India's environment, on uh, India's forests. And, uh, you know, people talk about this as development, but wh what is meant by that development? You know, the people who own these mines uh, are actually, most of them are like crony capitalists, uh, you know, so they will get very, very rich. But the people who live in those forests, who've historically uh, lived in the forests, sustained themselves in the forest, what's going to happen to them? So we see th th that question being answered straight away in so many parts of central India. In fact, uh, uh, you know, indigenous uh, Adivasis have just been pushed into uh, the equivalent of reservations, you know, very uh, actually uncannily like the reservations that were established in uh, in America in the, in the 19th and uh, uh, early 20th centuries, you know. And, uh, you know, you see these uncanny sorts, uh, sorts of reprisals uh, of this of this model of society. I mean, there are these schools now which take away Adivasi children and educate them, uh, you know, so-called educate them in uh, out of their uh, traditional cultures. So, you know, we are seeing, and really the terrible tragedy of this is that Adivasis above all are the people who've protected these forests. They've protected, uh, you know, the wildlife. But in fact, the models of development that have been pushed upon us, uh, you know, since the Second World War are 
incredibly sort of filled uh, with antagonism towards uh, towards indigenous peoples everywhere. This has happened even in Africa. The World Wildlife Fund essentially, uh, you know, they invested uh, enormous sums of money in what is essentially ethnic cleansing. Indigenous peoples were moved out of places like the Nagorongoro crater, and these uh, areas were opened up for what? For tourists, middle class tourists, and the tourism industry. That's happened across the board again in India. A lot of these are just actually just land grabs by uh, by uh, middle class urban elites. Yeah. What is uh, ironic is, of course, that this book uh, you wrote through the course of the pandemic and the pandemic had returned, uh, at least during periods of lockdown across the world, a kind of romance around the blue sky, and the chirping of the birds and reconnecting with the environment and so on. But actually, you now have data that tells you that as the economy emerges from the shadows of, uh, of the pandemic, uh, the dependence on uh, conventional energy resources has gone up, not gone down, right? And this is ahead, of course, of uh, the big global uh, sort of uh, climate change summit that's coming up in uh, Glasgow. How do you look at that? That that irony, that you know, that irony that this was supposed to be a time when people were sort of romancing nature again, and the data actually tells you a very very different story. Look, uh, you know, I think it was all perfectly predictable. I mean, I was never taken in by this uh, Pollyannish, uh, Pollyannaish narrative that, uh, you know, everything is going to get better, uh, you know, that, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Because actually the historical experience shows that when pe people come back from uh, an epidemic or a pandemic, they actually redouble, uh, you know, whatever it is that they were doing before. So the 1918 uh, influenza epidemic uh, led to the uh, the roaring 20s in America, you know, when uh, and finally culminated in the Great Depression. And people were predicting that, uh, you know, so it's not, uh, it's not, uh, to me, at least, it's not at all surprising that, you know, we've just come uh, crazily back into this, uh, into this high consumption mode. And I think if anything, uh, it's really going to get worse. I mean, there's, there's so much hope, uh, you know, yesterday, I did, I did an event with young activists uh, in New York from the Sunrise Movement. And, uh, you know, young people here, are so many young people, really, are just desperate for a sort of uh, a change of course. But as we can see, the American political system is such that no change of course is going to be possible. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the Biden administration had a lot of sort of uh, ambitious goals for climate change, but it seems now one single senator who actually has uh, is deeply invested in coal and uh, his family has, uh, has uh, you know, all sorts of coal interests. Uh, now it seems that he's just going to be able to hold up uh, the entire climate change agenda. So, you know, it's a very, very uh, a sad and difficult situation because it's not even clear how many people from the global south uh, will be able to attend uh, this, uh, these sessions in, uh, in Glasgow. You remember, this is a pattern that we are seeing. Uh, you remember before uh, the, uh, the Paris uh, uh, COP uh, meetings, there were the yeah. terrorist attacks and on the pretense of security, uh, the French government actually locked up a large number of, uh, of activists. So activists had no presence there. Uh, the negotiations were completely dominated by bureaucrats, technocrats, oil corporations, uh, and billionaires of various kinds, you know, of various kinds, you know. So that's, I think, uh, we're going to see some sort of rep uh, a reprise of that. We already have, there's, there's news out there that Australia, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, are diluting the language. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a grim scenario. Yeah. And and of course, uh, you know, uh, what I was struck by was the last time we were talking, uh, you know, I had just returned uh, from Uttarakhand, where we'd seen uh, a, a, sort of that horrible uh, landslide. And now we have seen again. Uh, uh, sort of flash floods, right? Uh, we've seen extraordinary images uh, coming out of, uh, you know, sort of places like Nenital, uh, absolutely ravaged. And yet we continue to not uh, have anybody take uh, climate change uh, seriously, even after these these pictures, these extraordinary images, I mean, Uttarakhand in some ways it seems to be almost sort of the cradle of this devastation, as it were. Uh, you know, and when you look at these pictures, Amitabh, what, what what, what goes through your mind? It's, it's almost as if, you know, uh, there's an echo chamber which accepts the climate change reality and then outside of it, no one wants to deal with it. 
it's uh, it's devastating to watch these uh, you know to to watch this footage to look at these pictures uh, you know i spent uh, I, I went to school uh, in that region and uh, you know i i, I love that region those, those mountains and if you remember the last time when we were speaking you were showing footage of what you saw up there yeah and yeah. it was horrifying to see that you know the forests have completely disappeared i remember those exact slopes you know around the hirigarwal etc are thickly forested the forests are completely gone you know complete deforestation this mad rush to build all these dams and uh, you know instead of trying to do something to protect ourselves from this horror that we know is coming we seem to be racing towards it uh you know we seem to be accelerating towards it it's completely crazy we know climate scientists have been telling us for a very long time uh that uh, actually the mountains are the most vulnerable region you know uh the mountains are vulnerable to so many kinds of impacts you know to a uh, glacial lake outbursts of all kinds to uh these rain bomb events this is not the first disaster we've seen in this uh, um, you know in this region i mean remember the kedarnath uh, uh, floods Uh, several years yeah. ago i mean all of that we can see this region is being absolutely devastated yeah why do you how do you explain because you spent so many years of you know of your of your life as a writer writing about these sometimes fictional sometimes non fictional how do you explain that denialism that you know it doesn't matter how bad it gets people are not willing to change their way of thinking or they change their way of life or the, or even their understanding of what development is what economic progress is uh it's just uh, it's just, look let's not uh, uh, let's not try to put uh, too fine a face upon this you know because actually what is really the, the reason that people are just carrying on like this is because they think that they won't be affected that someone else will die someone else will lose their money someone else will lose their uh, will lose their house and everything else you know that's what basically you know we uh, we locked ourselves into a kind of demonic mode mm -hmm. where we are just uh, hoping and expecting that someone else will die or someone else will suffer but this is a complete yeah. delusion you know it's a complete delusion we will all be affected you know but you know this this thing of it won't happen to me this is something climate change or this kind of destruction is something that happens to other people i mean you can you you you, you like how, how how do people tell themselves that like why do people feel insulated well i suppose it's the same way that people feel insulated in war time they they, they feel insulated uh, from all kinds of disasters but in india particularly you know after all india is run by a by a middle class you know and as you know and as i know middle class people in india you and i we were brought up uh, to have uh, uh, this kind of mechanism uh, for for creating indifference you know to not notice the suffering that is all around us you know to uh, we are so expert at shutting our eyes to the uh, to people on the street you know who are just uh, lying there in desperate need and this is what it actually is i think that's uh, we are so accustomed uh, to uh, to being indifferent you know that we above all are people uh, who are who have that that kind of equipment that lets uh, lets us shut our yeah. eyes and hope for the I you know and, and and yet you know the images you're seeing on your screen this time are from uh, kerala so from kerala from the south to the north of india you're actually seeing evidence of everything that you're 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 speaking about and yet this denialism continues let me ask you in the end uh, you know one of the big debates or the fault lines of uh, this debate uh, around sustainable development the you know the idea of economic progress and climate change uh, has been uh, you know who who's responsible who bears the cross uh, is 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 the sort of the western world which are countries more responsible is there a cultural specificity even within that framework that we have to be mindful of that there isn't a one size fits all address uh, of this how do you how do you see that you know uh, there are indians who turn around and say that we can't afford this we can't afford the west's idea of what should be done to counter climate change to counter uh, this kind of extractivist uh, economy that you speak about in your book look uh, i'm not unsympathetic to that obviously climate change fundamentally is about inequalities 
you know, it's about uh, it's about economic inequalities. It's about geopolitical inequalities. If you go to anyone, whether it's in China, India, Indonesia, uh, Nigeria, and say, well, uh, are you willing uh, to uh, make deep cuts in your emissions in order to, uh, you know, to cut back uh, on uh, on global greenhouse gas emissions? They'll say, no, why should we cut back? The West should cut back first. And of course, they they're completely right. I mean, this problem is uh, uh, is is the making of uh, industrialized uh, countries. You know, there there can be no doubt about that. And uh, clearly, uh, you you know, that's not without foundation. But there are two issues here. One is that when you are facing clear and present danger, as people in India are. I mean, you you showed pictures from Kerala. Remember all those rain bomb events in. Uh, in Chennai, remember all the all the rain bomb events in in Mumbai. When you're in clear and present danger, apart from the question of equity, you also do have to think about your own safety. You know, you have to think about how how do you create resilience for yourself. So there are two aspects to this question. One is the question of of, of justice, and there I think you know my uh, my my friend Sunita Narayan and, and Alila Agarwal had the best possible formulation a long time ago in their seminal paper on climate justice, which is that we have we have common but differentiated responsibilities, you know, and that's really the position that we have to take. Absolutely, and you know, I mean, I'm just actually seeing those pictures, and it just drives home having actually reported uh, from, especially Uttarakhand, so many times uh, during this kind of uh, devastation, how we can afford to think that the, that this danger is in the future; it's already in the present. And I think that's the point that really needs underlining. A fascinating new book from you, Amitabh. I have no idea how you're so prolific. The yeah. Nutmex Curse, uh, uh, really an extraordinary, important uh, piece of work, Amitabh. A pleasure as always. That is Amitabh Ghosh's new book. Do pick up a copy. Uh, it is, as always, uh, provocative about what we have come to accept uh, and internalize as a development. And that is the very uh, sort of a basis and fundamental that Mr. Ghosh is questioning. Thank you, Amitabh. Take care. Thank and you, Baka. Thank you for having me. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo's story and support independent, robust journalists.